Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In our culture, great emphasis is placed on the opinion of the individual. We are told that our opinion counts, that our vote matters, and that our personal preferences are relevant. We are taught to think this way because it benefits the institutions we serve. In truth, an institution asks your opinion, one, because it wants to increase its power, or two, because it wants to increase its profit. At the individual's level, the one thing that does matter is the very thing that institutions fear, wisdom and its associated behaviors. Wisdom cannot be exploited or manipulated. Wisdom is honest and straightforward. Wisdom is bad for business. Unlike our institutions, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus does not care what anyone thinks. His only desire is the knowledge of God's teaching. He wants everyone to become wise by clinging only to the words of Scripture. He demands nothing of his followers except biblical wisdom. In fact, he cares so much about this wisdom given for the life of the world that he is willing to give his life for its sake. This is the glory that Jesus proclaims, and it has nothing to do with the glory that Peter seeks. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 171 of the Bible as Literature podcast. When reading the Gospel of Mark, there are certain things that you must always keep in mind. Number one, the disciples are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Number two, of all the disciples, Peter is the most problematic. Number three, Jesus is typically frustrated with the disciples for not understanding. Number four, Jesus is frustrated with everybody because they're concerned about his miracles and his identity and not paying attention to what he teaches. And number five, the Pharisees push this to the point of apostasy because in violation of the Lord's commandment in Deuteronomy, instead of testing the man on the basis of the Torah, they test the man on the basis of signs and wonders dismissing the Torah. And now we come to this point in chapter 8, Richard, where the disciples still refuse to understand the meaning of the teaching, which is what controls the value of the sign, not vice versa. Jesus is trying to change the way that they think. Jesus is trying to get them to think scripturally. When he performs miracles and they're impressed by the miracles, they can either think differently or think the same. They're impressed by the miracles, they're thinking the same. Because anyone could come and perform a miracle and they would be impressed. Jesus is irrelevant in that case. They think it's cool because their cousin can't perform miracles like that. But anyone who came and performed those miracles would be impressive. But no one teaches like Jesus teaches. That's the part that actually changes the way that people think, but that's the part that is just bouncing off of their forehead. It's going in one ear and out the other. Verse 27 is a trap because in verse 27, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? This is a trap, because throughout Mark, what the crowds say is irrelevant. And problematic, actually. And Jesus keeps telling them not to say anything. So the correct answer to this question is to challenge the question. 
The correct answer is to say, Lord, it does not matter what people say. It does not matter what we say. It matters what scripture says. That is the correct answer. But Jesus knows they're not going to give the correct answer, which is why he will shut Peter down in this passage in the same way he shuts everyone else down. Now, recognize the way that Jesus asks the question, who do people say that I am? Not who am I, it's who do the crowds think I am? And like you said, Father, what the crowds think is irrelevant. That's why it's a trap. The disciples think they're asking because they think, oh, maybe Jesus doesn't know what the crowds are thinking. He's always trying to escape the crowds. He's always avoiding the crowds. We know we can help Jesus out. We can inform him what's actually going on out there. Now, finally, he's talking about something worldly so I can contribute to the discussion. Let me explain to you, Jesus. They told him, saying, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. But others, one of the prophets. Now, of course, the answer demonstrates that they don't understand. The crowds clearly don't understand. Some of them think this, some of them think that, some of them think another thing. They don't have any consistency among them. They don't know scripture. They don't understand the passages of scripture that Jesus repeatedly quotes and applies. But they're very familiar with the gossip around town. Now, the fact of the matter is, the gossip around town in the content of their answer is functional because it defers to the metaphors of the Mark and narrative. But the fact that they answer Jesus with the gossip from around town, whether he asked or not, the fact that they answer the question shows that their head is in the wrong place. Being interested in what the people are saying is another form of clinging to the fireworks show. On the level of the narrative, the crowd doesn't know scripture, the crowd doesn't know what it's talking about, but when we look at the level of what Mark, the author, is trying to do, it's interesting that he calls out John the Baptist and Elijah, whom he uses in other places in scripture. So the way that Mark presents the scene, as opposed to what's happening within the scene, Mark is connecting this scene to those original people who went out to John the Baptist because they thought John the Baptist was awesome. But John the Baptist within the narrative is saying, no, it's about another guy. So when they come and say, oh, they think he's John the Baptist, they don't even know what John the Baptist was teaching. Because John the Baptist was teaching that it's not about me, it's about somebody else. So Mark the author is able to make these connections by calling out these names, using the events in the story and the confusion in the story to his benefit. A contemporary Westerner cannot understand this passage correctly. It is impossible. You cannot understand it because you live in the reality of cable news in which the average opinion of somebody buying a coffee at Dunkin Donuts matters. This is an illusion. It doesn't matter. They play on your ego and act as though it does matter in order to manipulate you. But at the end of the day, this society and its institutions will do what they're going to do irrespective of the opinion of the man standing in line at Dunkin Donuts. This is extremely important to understand. And when you buy your fancy coffee at Starbucks with 14 options, you are buying into that lie because you accept the illusion of choice. Do I want sugar or more sugar with my caffeine? It's a trick, it's a hoax, you have to understand this. But if you come from that cultural perspective where you expect others to seek out your opinion, because of a presumed self-relevance, which is scientifically inaccurate. I mean, Carl Sagan popularized this notion, which is very ancient. There are billions and billions and billions and billions of stars, and the planet on which we live is not relevant. So how is the opinion of the individual relevant? I want to stress this point. The disciples, in this regard, are like excited people being interviewed by CNN. Call on me, he wants to know what I think. The correct answer is to say, it's not my place to answer. And this, again, is very difficult for people who believe it's their right to give their opinion. But that's not the historical context of this book, and that's not the narrative context in Mark. Because Mark has been invalidating the opinion of the crowds systematically. So this is a test to see whether the disciples will accept that what people say and what they say doesn't count. So when Jesus pushes further 
And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Peter was wrong to answer that way. Peter walked into a trap. Notice how Peter's the only one who spoke. All the other disciples at least were smart enough not to say anything. Peter is the betrayer, but is also the character who betrays Paul in the narrative arc of the Pauline corpus. This is the one who answers the question self-righteously. It's not okay for Peter to evaluate Jesus, even if Jesus asks. If your teacher asks you to evaluate the teacher, if it's a good teacher, and you answer, you'll be in trouble. Peter is in trouble because if Peter actually thought that he was the Christ, then how come he couldn't understand about the leaven of the Pharisees? How come he couldn't understand about the loaves? How come he couldn't understand why Jesus wanted to leave the crowds? Peter isn't making sense. And this is very typical of Peter's character. At one moment, he's saying exactly the right thing. And at other moment, he shows that he doesn't understand anything. And that's how Peter's personality functions. Here he is saying, you're the Christ. And Jesus knows very well, when I was multiplying the loaves, the second time you wanted to go and buy bread for them. How does that even make sense? The Gerasene demoniac here is nicely contrasted with Peter because once the people of Decapolis rejected Jesus, Jesus instructed the Gerasene demoniac to go tell everybody about what happened and to preach. Decapolis and the demoniac passed the test that Peter just failed because what does Jesus say in the next line? And he warned them to tell no one about him. And everybody stumbles, and everybody sees this as a red herring that Jesus is trying to hide his identity. But that goes against the narrative, because all Jesus is doing here is what he's done all along. Because I don't want you, Peter, talking about the Christ, because you don't know what the Christ is. Peter, you think it's because the miracles, just like the crowds, you're no better than them. You don't know what Torah says, yet you think I'm the Christ. As far as you're concerned, I could be the Antichrist, and you wouldn't know the difference. That's the point. That's exactly the point. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So now he's pushing harder. You didn't understand anything that I've done or said so far. Let me get right down to the heart of the matter. He's like a teacher who's furious and taking the gloves off. They're going to kill me. You're excited about miracles and signs and wonders, and I'm going to lose. I'm going to be defeated. There will be no victory for me. Once the signs and wonders end, what are you going to think of me? This is the question. Because everyone is excited about the signs and wonders. And as I said a few episodes ago, Jesus has to train them so that they can see that it's the Christ hanging on the cross. If they are continuously impressed by signs and wonders and not by the teaching, they will not be able to see that it is the king of glory, not a mark and phrase, but it's the king of glory on the cross. They won't be able to see it. So now, right after when he says he's the Christ, really, you think I'm the Christ? Let me just tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to be rejected, and I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise again. What do you think of that? How does that fit with your Christ theory? Well, we know how it fits with Peter's Christ theory. And he, Jesus, was stating the matter plainly. So Jesus is going in and saying as bluntly as possible the content of the Torah, that the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, and he's going to lose badly. And implicit in that are consequences for everybody who hitches their wagon to Jesus. So you're excited about the miracles. You're excited about this idea of your Messiah, who you expect to do something for you, like you expect of your king or your local representative in a democratic society. But I'm actually going to put you in a worse position than when you started. And how does Peter react? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Jesus now is forcing the matter, getting down to brass tacks, speaking plainly. He is bluntly telling you without 
any parable, without any limitation, without any prep or couching. He is saying, we are going to lose and I'm going to be the first loser. And how does Peter respond to the truth of the gospel, to the fruit of the Torah, which is the curse of Deuteronomy and the death of Jesus Christ? How does Peter respond? He pushes back. He takes Jesus to school. He He tries to teach Jesus. He pushes back like someone who's struggling with the sermon that relays this message in church. But Jesus, you don't understand. You don't get it. You're not sympathetic. It doesn't make sense what you're saying. It goes against the way we do things around here. Peter is defending himself. Peter doesn't want Jesus to be crucified. Peter doesn't want Jesus to talk that way because he's superstitious. Peter is like a person who doesn't want to hear any bad news because they don't want to think of how it could apply to them. Oh, I might die one day. Oh, don't say that. Hush. Don't talk that way. Hush, hush. None of this death talk. As though by not talking about death, it's not going to be a reality for you. Turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And this is the point. People always preach this passage, Richard, as though Peter got it, and then he didn't get it. How could Peter get it in the beginning, but not get it just a moment later? Because he never got it. He never understood what was going on. This is Peter. Peter was also functioning like the demons when he called Jesus the Christ. That is the point. He's like the demons at the beginning of Mark who are shouting Christ in a crowded room to obstruct the Christ. And what does Peter do? He tries to obstruct the Christ. Think about it logically. All of these explanations you hear about how wonderful it is that Peter finally understood who Jesus is, these explanations are explanations of the preacher's presuppositions. They're not dealing with the narrative. Peter in Galatians goes back and forth. You know, in Acts, it sounds like he understands Paul's gospel. Then in Galatians, he's sitting with Gentiles, and then he decides not to sit with Gentiles. Sometimes Peter gets it, sometimes he doesn't, which means that he never really actually got it. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, which does not correspond to clinging to Jesus to get something from him. This is very serious. The function of the community gathered around the teaching of Jesus Christ is to serve, not to be served. And it is service in a very uncomfortable way. It is slavery. It is the slavery of Exodus. We've said this before. I want to say it again loud and clear. If you are serious about the cause of the gospel, your life doesn't matter. Peter is allergic to the bad news that one day Jesus is going to die. So what does Jesus do? He keeps on it. Because look, if he says, pick up your cross, think about this in the Roman Empire. If you're picking up your cross in the Roman Empire, what does that mean? It means you are minutes away from being executed. You have minutes left to live. All cares and concerns go away when you have a few minutes to live. Unless you're at that stage where you have no concern about death, you've completely embraced the reality of your death and mine, you cannot be my disciple. And Peter clearly has not grasped it. That's why he wants to shove it under the rug. You have to accept that I and you are going to die, perhaps in the next five minutes. And with that fervency, you must teach and understand and seek to understand the message. Peter is called Satan because the word Satan in Hebrew means roadblock. He is an obstacle to the feet of Jesus running to sow the seed of the gospel in Mark. That is why he is the Satanas. It's a very specific function, and he is opposing God's interest, which is strictly the Torah. That is the key in Mark. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And here Jesus is talking about life in the sense that Genesis talks about life, life in totality. The individual is not the reference here. Everyone's going to die. The question Jesus is posing, what is the purpose of your death? Are you going to die for your own interests and your own enjoyment, then you are gone when you die. But if you're going to die for God's interest, which is the Torah, then you become a martyr. 
then you become a functional crucifixion, which is what Jesus is talking about here, and then your death becomes a source of life. Once you accept that you've already died and your life is for the gospel, all you do is you teach up to the point where your actual earthly death is also a teaching. That's all you can dedicate yourself to is that teaching. And Jesus has already demonstrated his own submission. He does not give his opinion. Notice, Jesus never gives an opinion. He just quotes the Old Testament. It's the disciples and the crowds and the Pharisees and the demons who give opinions. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul, his life? What good is it if you make tons of money, if Jesus heals you, if you have a great life, if it's just for you and you take it with you to the grave? What good is your money? What good is your accomplishments? What good is anything? What good is healing the people? If Jesus is healing the people just so they can die at a later date, what good does that do unless there's a teaching that comes from it? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul, his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And this is a very painful message because Peter is hoping that Jesus is going to finally be the Messiah who restores the throne of David and fights for Israel. And Jesus is telling them, no, I'm coming to fight you if you stand in my way like you're doing now, Peter. This judgment comes already when one looks at Jesus on the cross. Do you feel ashamed that your king, that your Christ is dead and cursed? Or do you see him as the king of glory? If you don't understand him as the king of glory, but are ashamed of him on the cross, and you don't want to look at him on the cross, you don't want him to be on the cross, you don't want him to suffer on the cross, you're embarrassed for him, then when judgment comes, Jesus has nothing for you. If you want the Jesus that you project onto the signs and wonders with your eye, the eye in the ancient world was thought to actually project a beam, and that's how it could see. So this is the basic understanding. If you are going to project into the signs and wonders and see your version of the Christ, who looks a lot like Alexander the Great, then when the true power of God is revealed, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be on the wrong side of that judgment. If you don't recognize him, he's not going to recognize you. And then you're going to pass away. Thanks very much, Dr. Benson. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.